going on? Hello, everybody. Could I ask you to take your seats? I'm just going to make a few remarks, but we are going to have a quick piano performance. So I'm going to ask you to turn off your devices while that goes through. Welcome, everybody. My name is Kitty Boone, and I'm responsible with a great team of people for producing the Aspen Ideas Festival for the Aspen Institute. It's really a pleasure to be back in the music tent for our 12th year. Thank you to Alan Fletcher and his incredible team for letting us use the music tent again and for offering us tonight Harris Hall, where we'll have performance and discussion starting at 7 p.m. and you're all invited to attend. It's such a privilege for us to create this program every summer. I don't think there's a better job in the world that allows people to spend time research researching the individuals in the world that are just truly remarkable. What, what they think about, what they do, how they lead us. Have such interesting ideas and, and share them with you. For all of you that are part of the stage and presenting this next several days, thank you. And for all of you that have presented already, thank you for your time and your energy in getting to Aspen. We certainly couldn't produce the festival without our underwriters. Thank you all. You're, you'll see them all across the campus. Um, and I have to always give a shout out to the 202 patrons whose generosity to the festival and to the Aspen Institute has allowed us to bring 300 scholars across the 10 days of the festival to Aspen to participate. Every year, we get asked whether we're going to take the Ideas Festival to other cities in sort of a franchise made mode in the US or around the world. What you may not know is that actually we are in communities around the US. For 11 years, high school students, scholars that have attended the Ideas Festival have mobilized their communities through Ideas Festivals they create and develop and present, focusing their schools and communities on a range of social and critical issues they learn about here to educate peers and adults alike, whether it's rural poverty, digital, digital literacy, healthy food, conservation, and more. At least one of these young scholars has landed in the White House to share his work with the president. And then others make headline news in myriad ways, which we try to share with our audience across the year as we hear about them. With thanks to the Bezos Family Foundation, we welcome the 2016 Bezos Scholars, who are joined by faculty and principals, And some of those young people up there have also joined us from Washington, D.C. and Chicago, having shared their prizes from the Aspen Challenge, which have allowed them to come here and present. Um, these are remarkable young people, and we're really thrilled to have you join us. Um, yeah. So with this afternoon, we offer a farewell to those of you who have been with us the last few days and a welcome to those of you that are joining us this afternoon. And because you're joining us, I have to give you a little bit of housekeeping. For starters, don't wear this, don't get in. Ask anybody with the first session pass and they will tell you this is the most important ticket you've got. You don't need paper tickets to anything, but you do need this. We have had high security and we're gonna to continue to that, do that and your, your pass is really critical, so please do that. And if you need any updates to your schedule, our app, which is really getting wonderful reviews this year, is the best way to find out what's new and current and how to plot your schedule, but also for any changes during the week. The next few days promise to be robust and challenging, whether it's Attorney, Attorney General Loretta Lynch speaking about criminal justice reform, 
32-year-old whiz kid Chris Cox speaking about how Facebook will connect 8 billion people across the world. That's his job. Tina Selig from Stanford University sharing how to get our ideas out of our head. Or game designer Jane McGonigal teaching us about growing our imagination. Or students and university leaders parsing for us what free speech versus respect and dignity means on today's college campuses. Whether the speakers here are known to you or individuals who are ideas or, or the individuals whose ideas you're not familiar with are speaking, you are in for a great time. And the one thing that I really encourage everybody to do is to please go and attend something you don't know anything about. Our goal is to introduce you to new ideas, not to rehash ones you're already very familiar with. It's now my great pleasure to introduce to you our first presenter, composer, composer and pianist Malik Jandali, a Syrian-American composer whose work integrates Middle Eastern modes in Western classical forms. Mr. Jandali's first piece for us today from his album Echoes of the Ugarit includes original compositions based on the oldest music notation in the world discovered on a clay tablet in the ancient Mediterranean Iranian city of Ugarit from 1400 BC. What makes Mr. John Daly so special to all of us is his commitment to peace and humanitarian causes, now formalized through his nonprofit, Pianos for Peace, founded in light of the plight of Syri's, Syrian children. Ladies and gentlemen, Malik John Daly.
Thank you very much. Salam, peace, shalom. I'm honored to be here at this beautiful symphony for peace. Ladies and gentlemen, in my hand is a replica of the oldest music notation ever known to mankind. And it happened to be that my ancestors in Syria invented it 1400 BC. Can you imagine the world today without music? Can you imagine the world today without the alphabet? My ancestors in Ugarit of the coast of Mesopotamia invented the ABCs. I am honored to present for the first time at the Aspen Ideas Festival Echoes from Ugarit, my interpretation of the oldest music notation in the world. It's about a woman who couldn't bear a child 3,000 years ago, asking God to have a baby so the civilization can continue in its contribution to humanity and peace. I hope you enjoy it. Echoes from Ugarit. Thank you very much. So funny, at the end of this hymn, we heard an iPhone. <laughs> and let me surprise you. The inventor of the iPhone is my cousin Steve Jobs slash Jamdali from Syria. <laughs> anyway, what I would like to present to you some melodies from destroyed Aleppo. Ladies and gentlemen, as we are sitting here, we have a brutal dictator eradicating is the civilization of humanity. It's a war against all humanity. He's destroying synagogues, churches, mosques, not to count the human lives. 
and it's my duty as an American artist, born in Germany, raised in Syria, to preserve the beauty and the truth of the Syrian heritage, which is the heritage of the world. So that's why I'm composing symphonies, recording them with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, and every year I uh, uh, <clears throat> release my uh, orchestral work at Carnegie Hall, and I invite the president and everybody I can invite. Everybody is invited to my Carnegie Hall concert next year. <laughs> so I would like to uh, perform a couple of uh, themes from Destroyed Aleppo. I have one minute, 29 seconds on my timer, and I hope you enjoy it. My message is peace. Check out Pianos for Peace, and I see you either at Carnegie Hall or at one of my amphitheaters in Syria soon. Thank you. Can you imagine if your country is being eradicated and people are drowning in the Mediterranean Sea? What would you do? I'm just, I only have music. It's my duty to preserve the culture and, and, and the beauty of my country. I just want to end it up with one story. I, I crossed the borders after I attended the um, funeral of Marie Colvin, the courageous American journalist who sacrificed her life in Homs. And uh, when I went and met with the children, I saw this little child on the operation room in one of the quote-unquote hospitals. 
And the last thing this little boy told the doctor on the operational room before he passed away, he looked at the doctor up and he said, I'm going to tell God everything. And he passed away. That's why I'm hopeful. That's why my world tour is the voice of the Syrian children. And I hope you enjoy and join me in my mission for peace and harmony and justice and our American values of freedom and equality in the world in my foundation, Pianos for Peace. Thank you. Peace. Shalom. Salam. That was beautiful. Our next speaker is someone else who brings the stories of people that sometimes most of us forget. And I know that in the context of the Aspen Ideas Festival, this can be a little watered down to say, but Brian Stevenson is a really big deal. We are so honored and thrilled to have him here. He's the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative which is an organization that represents defendants who are um, innocent, who are abused, neglected, ju incarcerated juveniles. He's argued six cases before the Supreme Court, and he has exonerated the innocent from death row. Without further ado, please give a warm Aspen welcome to Brian Stevenson. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful gathering, and I'm delighted to be a part of it.
That was fantastic. I'm Khalid Bretman with the Aspen Institute, and it's my pleasure to introduce our two next presenters. Ross Anderson is a senior reporter for The Atlantic, and Yuri Milner, venture capitalist and physicist, will be talking about technology and space exploration. Let's give them a warm welcome. All right, thanks for joining us, Yuri. Um, it's getting hard to write a concise biography of you. Um, <laughs> your day job is you're a venture capitalist, um, but in recent years you've become known for these really ambitious science projects, really science fiction projects that you've been bankrolling, um, including a massive search for extraterrestrial intelligence and a probe to Alpha Centauri. Um, I want to geek out on those two projects in a little bit, but first let's start with Silicon Valley. Um, can you give us an idea of the mood there right now? Like I get kind of the sense that some people feel like the party of the last 10 years is over. Is that how it feels? Well, um, I would say uh, to some people uh, maybe yes, but but to give you the scale of the party of the last 10 years, there was uh, $2 trillion worth of value created in uh, internet consumer uh, technology. Every five years, there's roughly $1 trillion being created. And 40% uh, of that value was created by new companies and new businesses. And, you know, I've been very fortunate to uh, have been able to invest in uh, some of them like uh, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Snapchat, and Spotify, and uh, Alibaba, and so on. And uh, to some people, this party may be over, but for somebody like me, I think this trend will continue in the sense that every five years there will be another trillion dollars created in, in, uh, in, in that space, and probably um, maybe 70% of that in, in, in this country, and probably 30% uh, elsewhere in the world. When you look at the kind of entire landscape of tech, uh, is there a particular subsector that's just really rich in good ideas at the moment, the way social media was, say, five, 10 years ago? Well, the... Um I think what happened in the last 10 years is that there were enough capabilities created to accumulate huge amounts of information. Um, and of course now everybody is a participant in this creation. So the next 10 years I think would be more about analyzing this information and uh, something that people call artificial intelligence. Uh, building intelligence agent um, agents and engines that would analyze this data that have been accumulated and is being accumulated at an unprecedented uh, pace. So my most recent experience was in Korea when I witnessed a, uh, the machine called DeepMind, it was, it was called AlphaGo, playing uh, the game of Go against the strongest uh, human being which was uh, from Korea. So the competition was in Seoul, and uh, the machine won uh, four to one. And this is probably one of the last games that uh, was very difficult to master by computers because it's so complicated. Um, and the, uh, the mechanism that is being used is neural networks, uh, the analog of the neural networks. So, so this is the future. Yeah, when, when you look back at the last cycle, um, is there a particular startup success that, that surprises you? Something that you passed on and that now you wish you could go back and invest in? Uh, yes, there is a company called Uber that, uh, <coughs> that we unfortunately missed. Um, but we, uh, we did manage to invest in, in uh, the Uber of China and the Uber of India. 
So we did not completely miss the trend, but, uh, but Uber is really one of those uh, companies that um, can really change the way we move from A to B in the cities. What made you skeptical about it initially? Well, the, uh, the thing is that the first way of tech companies were really built by hardcore engineers. And, um, but I think most of those companies have already been built. The companies that are being built right now, and Uber is a good example of it, is that it combines offline and online expertise. So there is a very significant offline element to Uber, you know, interacting with drivers and uh, governments and uh, mayors of the cities and things like that. So there is a significant offline element to it, which we did not recognize, uh, uh, unfortunately, early on. Um, I can't be alone in noticing that uh, there's no shortage of space enthusiasts in the tech community. Um, there's you, there's Elon Musk, there's Jeff Bezos, there's Mark Zuckerberg, who recently signed on to your interstellar probe. Um, what's going on there? Why is there this kind of just uh, really intense enthusiasm about space in that community? Well, it's, uh, it's really a good question. I think that um, it's an exciting frontier, and uh, Silicon Valley, of course, is the place with a lot of ambitious people and uh, people with big ideas and, and dreams. And of course, space is uh, one of those areas that really is sort of not 100% commercial endeavor, but rather uh, something which lies in between commerce and nonprofit. And uh, again, there are a lot of people in Silicon Valley who are uh, very, um, non-profit oriented and who uh, who spend a lot of money to change the world. I want to move now to this project that you recently funded uh, to search um, for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, a few years ago I had a conversation with Elon Musk and he gave me his usual line about the possibility that we live in a computer simulation. And he's got all kinds of arguments for this, but one thing that uh, I was really struck by was his, uh, he seems quite taken with the notion that when we look out into the universe, we don't see any evidence of other intelligent beings. Um, do you sh share his surprise about that? Uh, I don't, and I disagree with him on this. I think the, in the last few years, um, there was a overwhelming evidence collected by NASA uh, telescopes, specifically Kepler, that the uh, planets uh, similar to ours are very widespread in, uh, in the universe. And in fact, uh, it is a scientific number, which is undeniable, that just in our galaxy there are probably 20 billion planets like ours in a so-called habitable zone meaning that there's uh, liquid water on the surface. And, uh, and this is just in our galaxy. This number should be multiplied by 200 billion galaxies in the universe. And then the numbers are pretty overwhelming for us to conclude that all this real estate was created just for us. So I think it's a very aggressive assumption that uh, is now almost mathematically incorrect. Because with so many possibilities, and with 14 billion years of uh, the existence of this universe, I think there were plenty of opportunities to develop life, and probably also intelligent life, and that's why we are uh, looking for, uh, for the signals. Do you have any sense, I mean, when, when you bankrolled this project, and I want to give the audience a sense of the scale of it, um, this is going to look at the million nearest stars, the core of our galaxy where most stars are, and then something like the hundred nearest galaxies for evidence of intelligent life. Um, and that's expensive. Uh, I think uh, your contribution alone was something like a hundred million dollars. And 
obviously there are always going to be people who say that money may be better spent on cancer research or on the hunt for a Zika vaccine. Uh, what do you say to them? Well, I, I, I tend to agree with these people, and I think there are many more <coughs> pressing problems that we need to solve other than looking for um, intelligent life uh, uh, in the universe. But at the same time, it's, it's a matter of scale. I think that, and here I am strongly convinced, that we should spend a small fraction of 1% of all our resources to uh, go after very ambitious goals and to fund these ambitious projects, uh, even though maybe they are very long term. So if we spend 99.9% .9 of our resources on solving immediate problems, including cancer and poverty and everything else, then this 0.1% will really be enough to go after slightly more existential uh, 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 questions. But I think if we spend zero attacking those co problems, then, uh, you know, this is just going to be too boring, to be honest with you. <laughs> I have to ask, when you agreed to commit this money, um, did you stipulate that like, you get the call if they find a signal? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so let's imagine you get that call, and it takes a, it takes a number of months, obviously, to verify. And, uh, yeah, th there were many attempts uh, before ours to look for the signal. Uh, what we bring to the table is a new processing technology that allows to uh, to get uh, probably a thousand more information per second and analyze it. So we will be able to do the search that, you know, was impossible even a few years ago and this, the scale of it. And, and the scientists who have been conducting the previous searches, they told me that they always had a bottle of champagne in the fridge in case they, uh, they hear something. And uh, when we launched our project, I basically put champagne on the table right away and I said, let's, let's drink champagne ahead of time so that we, you know, we, we don't have this thing hanging out in the fridge. Also, it could be a while. Um, imagine you get that call and then over a, a period of months the signal is verified and, and we're all convinced, more or less, um, and we go public. What, does, what do you think that does to human culture? Yeah, I, I don't think we'll be able to hold it for a few months, by the way. I think maximum few days. And it will leak uh, because of the social media and, and, and so on. But, um, but I think the significance of this, uh, although I would be the first to recognize that this is a low probability uh, um, project to be successful in the next 10 years, although I'm convinced that it's, it's worth doing because low probability is compensated by the significance of, of this discovery. So I think that if we get the signal, life will not dramatically change and uh, you, know, you will continue to write your pieces and I hopefully will continue to make investments. But in a, in a subtle way, I think everything will change. Everything, because knowing that we are not alone in the universe, is, um, although it cannot be monetized, is, uh, I think, an existential question. And probably the most interesting questions are the ones that never lead to any profit. So maybe this is one of them. You don't always hear that from venture capitalists. Um, so the SETI search was the first of your $100 million projects. The second is this Alpha Centauri probe mission and I just want to give our audience a sense of how ambitious it is. Uh, our current kind of flying fastest, fastest flying space probes, uh, they travel about a million miles a day. And if we were to send one to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star, it would take tens of thousands of years to arrive. Um, you and your team have a mission concept for a probe that you say can arrive in 20 years and send back images that would arrive here, images of any planets that might be there, and that's an open question, um, and send back images that would arrive here in four years, which is to say within the lifetime of people who are in this tent. Um, 
Can you give us a basic sketch of how that would work? Okay, so um, again, the amazing developments in technology um, makes it possible right now. And I think our generation is very fortunate that we have this incredible opportunity to go beyond the solar system and for the first time ever reach out into the universe and send a man-made probe, of course robotic, to the nearby star. The way people usually think about it, um, unfortunately, is not going to happen because we're thinking about huge spaceships moving you know, through the wormholes, something like Star Wars style uh, project. And I'm not even talking about the cost of that, but we just don't have enough energy uh, to accelerate those huge machines to, to speeds comparable to the speed of light. And uh, we will not have enough energy for a very, very long time. But what is incredible is that now we do have enough energy to accelerate a very small probe to about 20% of speed of light, and small meaning a few grams. And uh, the developments in the last 10 years allow us to build a spaceship which will be very small, you know, like a, maybe an inch big, and uh, will weigh a few grams. So we, uh, we believe that this can be done already today. And this little spaceship will have capability to take images and send those images back to our planet. Now, the way to accelerate this probe is, is a very old one, which is uh, go back to a few hundred years ago when we were traveling without fuel using the wind and the sail. Um, so the only way we can travel to the nearby star is to leave the fuel behind, not to take any fuel, and to accelerate this very small probe with a very big beam of light. And, uh, and we now know the technology, how to create this big beam of light and uh, use the so-called solar sail to, uh, to launch this little probe to the nearby star. You mentioned uh, images that it might be able to send back. Uh, what might those images look like? Like what kind of resolution are we talking about? Or what kind of features on these hypothetical planets might we be able to make out? Well, the, uh, the quality of the picture would be similar to the iPhone uh, uh, quality, which is very good. And, um, and uh, you, um, if you fly by uh, a planet, and we don't even know yet whether there are planets there, um, although it's the nearest star system, consisting of uh, two stars, uh, so-called binary star, uh, we, uh, we will be able to send back images and some other scientific data like uh, magnetic fields. Uh, we will probably be able to see if there are any signs of life on, on, uh, on those planets and so on. The last time that you and I talked about this, uh, you said something that really stuck with me. Uh, we were talking about the um, <laughs> geopolitical complexities of putting what amounts to a massive laser cannon on the surface of the earth. And you said that you weren't sure that we as a civilization were mature enough to take this on yet. Can you tell me a little bit more what you meant by that? Well, uh, this project, if it happens in any foreseeable future, and we believe that uh, it is doable probably in a 25 to 35 year time frame, this will require a, a global consensus, uh, no doubt. Because sending something to the nearby star is not just a small project that you can build in your garage and quietly do this. I think in, in, in a way you are representing the planet. You are sending something which is moving very fast and going very far with you know unknown implications. So we will have to, first of all, agree on the mechanism on how we agree that we should be doing this. And whether it should be United Nations or maybe some other organization 
that should be making this decision remains to be seen. But it definitely should be similar to the largest scientific projects that uh, we uh, have been successfully uh, uh, launching, uh, for example, CERN, you know, the big collider in Europe. Before we go, I wanted to ask you, um, knowing you a little bit, I know that this is not going to be the last of your science fiction projects. And um, uh, since it's just us two talking here in this tent and we're off the record, uh, could you give us a hint about the direction of your thinking for what's next? Well, I think this is uh, big enough of a project uh, uh, in itself. And um, I, I think if it is a uh, 25 to 35 year project, then uh, you know, we can sit down at that time and uh, see what, uh, what else we can do. But, but I think that it's really, uh, to me, very humbling and, uh, and I feel very special that we are the first generation after a few billion years of evolution on this planet that can even conceivably think about doing something like this. And if we in fact are capable of launching a spaceship to the nearby star, I think our century can be um, this is definitely one of the things that our century will be remembered for. Yuri, thanks for joining us today. This has been great. Wow, what a great conversation between Yuri and Ross. And I hope I will have a chair. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson of the Aspen Institute. And we have asked three terrific panelists to join us for a conversation about this most recent Supreme Court term and its significance. Stephen Carter, a distinguished professor of law, a cultural critic, and a wonderful novelist to boot. Uh, Nina Totenberg, simply one of the country's most celebrated Supreme Court analysts, and Nancy Gertner, a former federal judge, now at Harvard Law School, and a passionate advocate, particularly for women's rights and civil rights and civil liberties. Justice Byron White once said that the loss, that the addition of a single member to the Supreme Court creates essentially a wholly new court. And perhaps it should also now be said that the simple loss of a member on the court creates a wholly different court, especially when the person lost is someone as profoundly influential as Justice Scalia. Uh, the term that just ended with some decisions that were radically different from those that were widely predicted just nine months before when a nine-member court set the calendar for the year. What many thought would represent a possibly transformative move further to the right due to the loss of Justice Scalia and due to the evolving views of Justice Kennedy instead turned to a term that at least in some key areas perhaps represent a transformative turn to the left notably in areas that have really been at the heart of American cultural wars for decades, specifically abortion and affirmative action. And we also saw the implications of 4-4 deadlocked court in areas as important as immigration and labor law, where frankly conservative blockbuster decisions were expected in each case, and instead that 4-4 deadlocked left lower court decisions in place. One celebrated by unions and one reacting with heartbreak for President Obama. So let's just start at, at really the highest level. And how, how would, what, would, what would you say, Nancy, about this post Scalia eight member court and this term? I'm gonna take a page from Nina's book, which is she's gonna say it's much more boring. but. Uh, I think that it, it's noteworthy for what it decided as well as for what it ducked. 
and it ducked the union case, it ducked the Affordable Care uh, Act, the challenge uh, to some of the contraception provisions to the Affordable Care Act, uh, and then in a sort of odd way in that decision, it literally invited the parties to try to settle, which was very interesting and very unusual. So it's noteworthy for what it ducked, and then it is tremendously noteworthy for what it finally decided in numbers in which Scalia wouldn't have made a difference. We'll be talking about that. Nina? Well, I look at it a little bit like that, as if it's a court of what it was and what it wasn't. Um, it was not the court of the previous year with huge landmark decisions on, most notably on same-sex marriage, or in a previous term on the ACA. It was, um, perhaps, and I say perhaps, the beginning of the end of the Reagan Revolution era on the Supreme Court, um, depending on what happens in the presidential election. It was a st strong affirmation of previous decisions on abortion and affirmative action. Uh, it showed really that there is a liberal to moderate core, which consists of Kennedy, Kagan, and Breyer, who voted together the most of any group on the court, 90% of the time this term. Of course, this was not your typical term. Um, and of course, Justice Kennedy was, again, a key player. He voted, he was the he voted in the majority in 97% of the cases. That's like a Soviet election. <laughs> and it was a paler term. Without Justice Scalia, it was for reporters, not the most dramatic and interesting and beautifully written and infuriatingly um, interesting court that it had been for nearly three decades. And as a reporter, and I have to say as a human being, I really miss him. Stephen. I, I don't entirely disagree with what uh, Nancy and Nina have said, but I have a slight dissenting view. I, I think that the court is in a tragic moment uh, right now. When I say tragic, I'm not referring to the tragic death of Justice Scalia. I mean, the court itself. Think of the way that we talk about it. We always know there's this person going to vote this way, this person going to vote that way. There might be a swing justice on this or that issue, but there's an enormous predictability to these voting blocks. And there are lawyers who will tell you how frustrating it is to get up and argue in front of a court where seven or eight justices have already made up their minds, and you wonder what, whom you're arguing to. Uh, and, and what you've seen in the court over the last two decades is a loss of any sense among the justices themselves that consensus is important that if you look at the court for most of its history, there were some very great and important 5-4 decisions in the past, but overall in its history, the hammering out of hard compromise in order to get a significant number of votes was a big part of what the justices thought their job was because they thought that the country is more persuadable when you have a significant majority or unanimous court than with a constant string of 5-4 or 5-3 uh, decisions. So whichever way, whoever wins the election, whoever is the next justice and so on, that tragic moment I think is going to continue. There are people who will cheer the next justice, there are people who will boo the next justice, but this process of really not trying on the court to find ways to actually find consensus, I think will continue and I think it's very unfortunate. I hope we'll have time actually to return to that theme, but let's actually drill down in some of the key cases here. Uh, whole women's health, uh, the abortion case out of Texas, one that many thought could have almost gutted Roe against Wade and had a significant effect on the other critical case, the Casey case. Uh, this was a 5-3 case. Nancy, just how important is this case? I, I thought it was one of the most important decisions uh, in a long time, particularly on women's rights issues, it was almost as if the court was saying that the regulations that had come out of Texas were finally a bridge too far. Uh, for the course of the past 20 years, it was this regulation and this, this restriction on abortion, this restriction, for the most part over, you know, upheld by the lower courts and upheld by the courts of appeals and certainly upheld by the Supreme Court, and this was a bridge too far. We all thought that bridge too far would be the criminalization of abortion. 
That is to say that it would be the only thing that would be left of Roe v. Wade would be you may not make it criminal, but you didn't have to fund it, you didn't have to provide facilities for it, et cetera. So it was very interesting that the court, and in particular Kennedy, finally said, enough. Uh, the Texas regulations, which required that abortion facilities, which had the, one of the safest records of any medical facilities, needed to have the kinds of requirements for an ambulatory care clinic, uh, uh, you know, the certain, uh, door, doorways of a certain, uh, of certain size and a certain kind of staffing, and that the members of the staff had to have admitting privileges to a hospital within 30 miles from the clinic. The combination of the two shut down half of the abortion clinics in Texas and threatened to leave only six or seven remaining. And this was now with respect to first, to pre-viability abortions. This was sort of the irreducible minimum of the right. If you could essentially eliminate facilities that serviced pre-viability medical abortions, et cetera, then there really was nothing left to the right, except you may not be thrown in jail for it. So I thought it was extraordinary. It was also deferential to the findings of the court. It invited the court to, it wasn't enough for the Texas legislature to somehow intone women's health. That was the other fear. If you said women's health, you didn't have to say anything more. And the court, the lower court examined this. Justice Ginsburg in a famous concurrence said, uh, the notion that this is remotely related to women's health is out of the question. Uh, the, not, this had nothing to do with women's health, this had to do with burdening the right to choose. So I thought it was quite extraordinary. And Kennedy's uh, change from, uh, the really extraordinary decisions he had brought, the negative positions he had taken with respect to abortion in the past was telling, and Scalia wouldn't have made a difference. This was a 5-3 decision. Uh, Nina, you've gotten some of the biggest tips from the impenetrable court over the decades and have some special insights, and I wonder if you have any thoughts, particularly about the evolution of Justice Kennedy's thoughts vis-a-vis uh, -vis abortion, and, and also any thoughts about how it is that this case was assigned to a man to write, Justice Pryor. Well, Justice Kennedy was the senior justice in the majority, so he had the duty of assigning the opinion, and he didn't assign it to himself. He assigned it to Breyer, who wrote a just the facts ma'am decision, and I suspect the reason that he was assigned the case and not Ginsburg is that very concurrence that she wrote, that Kennedy and Breyer understanding this didn't want that kind of a, of a women's rights kind of passionate uh, decision, that the facts mattered here. This was a sham law. They never said it was a sham law. But in everything they said in this decision that Breyer wrote, he said, I asked it at oral argument, we asked the state of Texas, give me one case where having privileges made a difference in Texas or anywhere else in the country. And the state of Texas couldn't come up with one. And so those were the kinds of facts that I think were determinative. The entire medical profession was on one side. And uh, I think that's why Kennedy voted that way. And I think that you know, somebody I know who knows him pretty well said once that he, this is not his issue. He's a very devout Catholic. He is against abortion, genuinely against abortion. It's hard for him to vote in a case like this, this way. But you'd have to be blind to the fact that you're telling poor women especially that they will have no opportunity to terminate a pregnancy. And that, I think, he, he saw. Nancy, let me just come back to you about this. What do you think uh, the implications of this will be in abortion litigation going forward? Could this be, especially perhaps if Hillary Clinton wins, the beginning of the end? Or are we going to continue to see Republican state legislatures staying ahead of the game with new legislation about uh, with requiring sonograms or talking about fetal pain or parental involvement? On the one hand, I don't think the press to uh, uh, come up with regulations limiting abortion will stop. I, I think that that's sort of part of the DNA of the Republican Party, or at least has been. 
Uh, I do think, though, there's some, it is enormously significant. I keep on getting back to the concept of a bridge too far. It's so significant. Up until now, the, the litigation has all been about this, is, this regulation is okay, this regulation is okay, this regulation. Uh, the significance of finally saying, you know, there's an end to that. There's a limit. And that certainly, that definition will affect, I think, the litigation of these cases. Because now courts will be able to say, well, if that didn't pass muster, then surely this doesn't. And without that model, the only thing that didn't pass muster was throwing women in jail. So I, I think that the, conceptually it makes a big difference, uh, but I don't think it'll stop the, uh, the efforts to, to pull back, to basically withdraw, you know, throw, overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, Stephen, we'll, uh, we'll get back to the more ideologically fraught cases in a minute, but instead I want to talk about a unanimous case. You talked a little bit about, about in, historically, the court tries to become unanimous. Uh, we just had a case involving corruption of the governor of Virginia. Apparently and, involving alleged corruption. Alleged, I'm sorry, <laughs> alleged corruption. Uh, the alleged but, governor of Virginia. <laughs> and the, the, at a time Former. when... Uh, you know, the nations and apparently the world fed up with politics as usual and the perception that, that the system is corrupt, either a small C or a big C. Here, the Supreme Court unanimously says that some behavior that's clearly unsavory uh, is such that it still led to a reversal of what happened below. What, what's going on here? Well, I, I I, I want to separate two issues when we think about the case. The case, as most people know, involved Bob McDonald, the former Republican governor of Virginia, who was accused of taking gifts in exchange for official favors. Uh, part of the problem was this, the federal statutes under which he was prosecuted were statutes that uh, require that there be an official act in exchange. And the government in prosecuting him listed the official act as basically arranging meetings uh, for this constituent who gave him these various loans in the hope, uh, who was hoping if he could have these meetings, he might be able to push his, he had some kind of nutritional supplement that he was, uh, uh, that he was trying to uh, push. And nothing came of the meetings, everybody thought it was a silly idea. So the government uh, took this case to trial, and, and the problem is, I think, as I think the Supreme Court correctly noted, that the definition of official acts the government used was just too broad. We all hate corruption, but it's not the job of the Supreme Court to make it easy to put people in jail. It's, it, you've got to read the statute the way that it's written. And it's striking to me uh, that a number of former uh, White House counsel from both Republican and Democratic administrations, um, a number of law professors who teach uh, in the criminal justice field. Me. I was one. Yeah, including, <laughs> including Nancy. And also... Um, a number of state attorneys general, in fact, I think 44 state attorneys general, all signed briefs saying this was government uh, overreach, and I think it was. I think we have to separate in all of these cases, in this one, it's, it matters at Janamis, in all these cases we have to separate uh, the notion that we don't like corrupt politicians to the notion that whenever the government, the, a prosecutor says, I've got him, that the courts have to go along uh, with that. I think the Supreme Court was right in suggesting that official act ought to involve a decision you make about something, that there's an actual exercise of power or pressuring someone else to exercise power in a particular way. Let's move back to some of the controversial cases uh, and Fisher against the University of Texas. By the way, what is it about Texas? I mean, I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, a few years ago it was Arizona. <laughs> a few years before that, it was Alabama. And then it depends a large part on the political leadership of the state and whether they want to bring these kinds, pass these laws, and then very actively challenge something that they see is not fair to them. Well, I'll stay with you then, then Nina. <laughs> um, uh, this case, of course, came back a second time. It involves race conscious uh, university admissions. And, and this is a case where there's no question, I think, that were Scalia still alive, there would have been a different outcome. Um, it would have been tied. Uh, so, so what are, tell us about this case and, and its implications. And it, you know, is the affirmative action battle at the Supreme Court over now? 
You asking me? <laughs> you wanted well, to talk about Texas. Well, nothing's ever over. But I think, depending on who's president next, uh, the, there are certain groups that have brought these cases. The same, this is the same organization that um, brought the challenge to the Voting Rights Act, brought this case, uh, brought a challenge that failed earlier this term uh, to the, how you view the concept of one person, one vote. Uh, the court will no longer be hospitable to those challenges if Hillary Clinton is elected, and it will be very ho hospitable to those challenges if Donald Trump is elected. So it, it, it matters. Uh, elections do matter. And, but in general, I think this was a re reaffirming of the idea of affirmative action, at least in one area. That's higher education. And it, I, it just seemed to me that this was a much more broadly written decision than I expected, and even though the Texas plan is different than most plans, this was a, an opinion that seemed to buy into the idea that this is necessary, at least for now, in the country we live in with the history that we have. Uh, and and the, uh, I'd like to ask maybe you, Stephen, uh, about the practical implications, what, what is the, and by the way, this is another case where Justice Kennedy, uh, I think it was the first time he ever voted to support affirmative action. Yes. So, so Stephen, what, are, what does this mean for universities now, given the majority opinion? How is race able to be considered, and what do you think the court is saying? Well, there, there's, again, there's, there's two important uh, points here. Uh, one is, uh, as I think your question suggested, and as Nita has mentioned, this issue is not going to uh, go away. The issue is going to rise again and again. And that was the second point. For just that reason, I, I think it's important that the court write good opinions. Um, and I don't want to step on anyone's toes here, but I, I, we tend to think about the justices, oh, they ruled this way, rah, rah, or they ruled that way, I hate them. But I think it's very important that they write good opinions. And the, the, uh, uh, the problem uh, with a lot of these opinions, and the problem with the jurisprudence even now in the affirmative action, is that it's very confusing. It's, it's very confusing. Uh, and I would prefer the world that Nina just described, that is, where the courts would be willing to say that the reason for these programs is because of a recognition of a need to correct a great historical injustice. But the courts have long ago dismissed that. They said that's not a rationale that we can live with, and so litigants and universities come up with the various other rationales. And, and, and I want to emphasize, so, so, so for example, they talk about diversity, and I want to emphasize here, I'm not talking about diversity the way that, say, corporations talk about it. I'm talking about the way that admissions officers uh, talk about it. And, and when you have to go into court and say that's the reason, then you run into this risk that, you know, then what would be wrong with the professor turning and saying, well, Mr. Carter, give us the black view of that. That's not what corporations mean when they say diversity, but that's what universities have been forced to mean or to pretend they mean uh, when they have to defend uh, these programs. I think the most straightforward defense, the one that universities should always press, is the notion of some sort of uh, corrective justice. I do think you will see um, universities being slightly more open, slightly, about the way that they consider race in admissions, except in the states where they can't, where it's not allowed, uh, but they'll be slightly more open uh, about it. But even in Texas, it is a, the so-called holistic program Texas ran is a, gives a, a slight advantage, but a, but a relatively small one uh, to black, and it's only for applicants who didn't finish in the top 10% of their classes, have a very slight advantage over white applicants who didn't finish in the top 10% of their classes. And that's really all, all that it is. And I think you'll see universities defending these little incremental programs, and that's fine. That seems to me that's perfectly reasonable. I think what you still will not see uh, is, you, and I hope you won't see, is university expressly say, we're going to have a quota, we need this many, and so on and so on. I think that ship sailed a long time ago, and it's good um, that it's sailed. But I think all of us, when we look around the Aspen Institute, we all talk about this, look at panels, look at other things, we all recognize that there is something that is, there's a different dynamic uh, that you get when you have different groups of people. It's not because there's a black way to look at things or a female way to look at things. It's just because, it, it, it's in a sense because we recognize we construct panels this way, we construct cl entering classes this way and other things, uh, that there are a lot of different ways in which 
there is a need to correct for imbalances that have happened because of actual historical events, as opposed to because you know we, we want left-handed pipe welders or something like that. I want to can Please, I just say Nina. one sort of yeah. interesting his, historical irony about the affirmative action case, which would, the justices voted to, to grant when Scalia was still alive, and the four conservative members of the court, and it only takes four votes to grant a case, I think they granted it because they thought it was their best chance to win, that they were very close to winning, and this was their best chance to win. And they didn't care that one member of the court was actually recused, Elena Kagan was recused, so it was not going to be in a nine-person court no matter what, and she, of course, would know more about admission systems than anybody else, since she was dean of the Harvard Law School. So they, but so they, they sort of, they force, I think that they actually force this case down Kennedy's throat. This is Nina speaking. I don't have any special knowledge. And then Scalia died. And it was a seven-person court. And Kennedy, Scalia wasn't there. I don't think they would have been able to force it down his throat anyway. This was its second visit to the court. And he, he finally had it, I think. Stephen, I want to just get back, if, just briefly if we can, to the points you made at the beginning about consensus as opposed to 4-4 four, four decisions, 5-4 five, four decisions. Do we have to have these 4-4 four, four decisions? And, and what are some, talk to us a little bit more about the yeah. implications of this divided court. It's really interesting. Uh, a lot of editorials in recent years, a lot of uh, op-ed columns have complained that because the Republican-controlled Senate won't vote on Merrick Garland, we have all these 4-4 decisions. But the court could fix this itself. It's not a big deal. In the British common law, there was a very long tradition uh, that if the court was tied, the junior justice would recuse himself. At that time, it was always a he out of a matter of comedy and respect for the other judges and say, we have to have an opinion, I will step back and therefore. Now you say that now, a lot of people say, well, I don't want that because then Elena Kagan will be recused. But when I think about procedural rules, the issue shouldn't be, well, what's going to get us the best outcome? The question is, what's going to get us around these various procedural roadblocks? And having four, four courts, which we will have in the future, is a procedural roadblock. It's a real problem when the Supreme Court of the United States can't muster a majority, and it ought to treat its own internal rules in ways that will try to get a majority in every case, and one simple way to do that, even if not a matter of a rule, a matter of tradition, which it was in the British common law, there was no requirement, it was just a tradition that developed, was the junior justice, or any justice, can say, I will recede in order that the court not be embarrassed, which is what one judge wrote back in the 19th Fat century. Chance. In order, Well, no, I agree. <laughs> that, but, but the lack of comedy is part of the problem. That's another reason that's a tragic it's age. It's not even right. comedy. I mean, really, we did revolt against the British. Uh, we don't have to do everything they did. I just think that's unlikely. Well, that, you know, it's, we're so lucky. We, we have a very distinguished federal district judge, uh, a former federal district judge with it. Nancy, how did, speaking as a judge, how do you react to 4-4 four, four decisions, even 5-4 decisions? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, um, I'm trying to write now what it was like to be a district court judge in a divided time. And what, what has happened is that if you have multiple decisions or a plurality with actually no legitimate decision commanding the majority of everyone, the district court begins to predict the direction that the court is going to go in. And over the past, I was on the bench for 17 years, I'd say for 20 years, district courts predicted a more conservative turn to the Supreme Court. And you frequently had, in fact, one scholar described it overruling from below, where essentially the courts had very crabbed views of the directions of abortion rights, the directions of affirmative action, predicting that that's what the Supreme Court is gonna do. So the question now is whether the winds of change will change the district court as well and have a sense of the new sort of jurisprudential movement. But I do want to go back to one thing because I think that this audience would be interested. I think the seeds of the McDonald case, by the way, was Citizens United. Justice Kennedy talked about the importance of constituent services, even for those who had, particularly for those who had contributed uh, to a camp, to a, to a politician. You give your money and in exchange you get access to the candidate, a seat at the table in the governor's mansion. And, and McDonald was ultimately about that. And I think that that's the reason why there was suddenly an eight zip uh, court. 
Uh, it was a very, it was because all of a sudden it privileged a view of politics, which, is, which the court said was tawdry, but it was a view of politics that it's really okay to give money in exchange for access and ingratiation. We, we just have a few minutes left, and, and Stephen, you mentioned Merrick Garland, who's been in the, in the uh, batter's box for months and may be in the batter's box longer than anyone in history. But I'd like to ask each of you as sort of concluding remarks about what next. I mean, we've had a relatively stable, conservative-leaning court, really since Justice Alito, so for 10 years. Uh, obviously, if Trump is elected, and the Republicans retain control of the Senate, it's relative, re reasonably apparent what, what might happen. If, if Hillary Clinton wins, talk to us about what happens in the lame duck session and what happens after that. Sort of take, take us forward. Uh, and it's, impor Steve? it's important to emphasize that when we refer to justices, it's common ground among us, I think, as liberal or conservative, we're talking about a very tiny number of mm -hmm cases, yeah. the, the ones that make the headlines. Lots of other cases, you look at evidence law or something like that, which I happen to teach, and they're all over the map. I mean, the, the biggest allies in evidence law, you know, it was this coalition of Scalia and Ginsburg against this coalition of Alito and Sotomayor. This was, these are the big evidence law coalitions. And it's important to bear that in mind because for a lot of the court's work isn't going to change no matter what happens. But on the issue of Merrick Garland, um, I, I I can't, whoever wins, well, I shouldn't say whoever wins, assuming the Democrats win the presidential election, without regard to who holds the Senate, I have to believe that Garland is confirmed in the lame duck session. Because if the, if the Republicans lose the Senate, they will think, one, we might get someone we like even less, but two, we have to build up some comedy, that word again, with the Democrats before they take over. If the Republicans hold the Senate, even and lose the election, they'll be in exactly the same position. They'll have to confirm because otherwise, a new a President Clinton is going to appoint someone if they ultimately defeat him, who they're going to like a lot less, and she'll be fresh with election victory, full of political capital. Well, my so, chances on the court are shot. I just wanted to make this clear. <laughs> now, now, wait a minute. So <laughs> you're, I, my, you're, my, you're my favorite nominee. I, I agree. I think the odds are that. Garland would be confirmed in a lame duck if the Democrats win the presidency. I do, and I certainly think it would be Garland. I do not think that the president would, would withdraw the nomination. On the other hand, if they don't do that, and you never know, uh, then I think Hillary Clinton likely would name somebody else. If for no other reason than Garland is 63, she, there is a chance she might not. She might not want to have a fight as her first thing that she's going to do, a fight, even though it's a fight that's easily winnable over somebody like this. And finally, as a matter of personal privilege, I just want to say one thing. I've been sitting here, I wasn't going to do this, but I grew up, not in this tent, but in its one of its, its original predecessor, because my father was a great concert violinist. And I realized as I was sitting here that I spent my childhood sitting in those rows with him right there in front of the orchestra, playing the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto and the Beethoven Violin Concerto. And I, Daddy, I'm, I'm finally here. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really wonderful. Nancy, we have time for a last word. What next? I, at this point, I think uh, uh, the court has changed fundamentally because no one would replace, uh, Scalia is totally irreplaceable. Uh, I do agree that I think Merrick Garland is going to wind up on the court in a lame duck uh, session. And I think some, uh, I don't think that people realize how much the jurisprudence of the court has changed and moved dramatically so that even the notion of moderates and liberals and conservatives really have a very different meaning today than it had years ago. I don't think you're going to see even dramatic changes on a Clinton court. If the Hillary Clinton wins, I don't think you're going to see dramatic changes on a Trump court either with respect to some of the issues we've been talking about. Let me thank our three panelists. Thank you all very much.
Welcome, everybody. It's my great privilege to present the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella. Satya has been the CEO for two and a half years, but it's been 24 years, I think, since you've been at Microsoft. 24 years is a long time, 1992. Uh, it was not legal for people to go on the internet as just common citizens. Al Gore hadn't passed the Gore Act, which is what got him in trouble when he <laughs> took credit for inventing the internet, but it did provide access. Bill Gates hadn't yet written the memo. Now you've taken over a company that's totally dominated by connectivity. Uh, let me start with the big question we've been talking about at the Ideas Festival so far, is that all of that will lead to an artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence will take our jobs and will have some frightening new future. Do you believe in that scenario? First of all, it's uh, great to be at uh, the Ideas Festival. <laughs> <laughs> because you got straight to the point. Um, I mean, quite honestly, it's such a privilege uh, to have a chance to sort of breathe the air, soak the atmosphere where you're celebrating ideas and to know uh, that you're in safe ground. That means any bad idea of mine will also be at least celebrated for a few minutes. Um, and it's just a privilege uh, to be part of this. You know, the, you know I wrote a piece um, just yesterday um, on AI because the thing that, the way I came at it, Walter, was I've been thinking a lot about as creators of machine intelligence and artificial intelligence, uh, what are the design principles? What's the design sensibility that we need to have as we create these applications or platforms? Um, you know, aside from Asimov, no one has actually said, here are some design guidelines for a software engineer who's creating AI. And I felt like the real thing today that we need is those guidelines for the creators. And when I thought about that, the first thing I said, wow, we have a choice to make, for example. So as creators, we can decide how we design them. So I fall in the camp of how do we create AI to augment the human capability enhance the human experience. Uh, so I fall into that camp. So now, then after that, I sort of said, let's go take it one click down and say, what are some of the things that one needs to do to build into AI so that the human welfare, quote unquote, is front and center? That means algorithmically, you need to be able to infuse into AI things like trust, trans, uh, you know, Basically, the ability to have transparency in how it works, to be able to take back control. And then, most importantly, how do you even infuse into the AI you create human values uh, of empathy? So I thought about that, and I, that's what I wrote. But one of the things that I also got to was, it, which kind of gets to the question you asked, what do humans need to do? in a world where AI exists. We can't sort of say, deny it. So one of the things which I think will still be scarce, even in an AI-rich world, would be empathy, curiosity, the ability of humans to be able to explore things which are non-linear. And it's, it's fine for AI to win uh, a, go, uh, you know, a game of Go, a final, it's a fantastic achievement, or to be able to get to high quality speech recognition, which uh, we have now, or image recognition, but it's not the same as being able to do what humans do today uh, when they're at their creative best or they're at their empathetic best. And education, uh, because what does it mean to give, give ourselves the skills to be able to, in fact, ride this AI way versus be afraid of it. But you know, when people say we need the skills to ride the AI way, they say, we have to teach engineering, we have to teach coding. I'm hearing you say, we have to teach creativity, we have to teach empathy, we have to teach the things the humanities teach us. Do you think uh, that in the future, we should be training our kids to do what machines can't do? I think that that's one avenue, for sure, which is in a world where, let's just take the following. 
Uh, it's, in fact, one of the use cases I just recently came across was someone who is an airline, um, an air, air engine, airplane engine mechanic um, started saying, okay, I want to do my job better, or uh, how can I do my job better? One of the things that they're now using is a HoloLens, which has the ability to, for example, put holographic output that is superimposed on top of the engine, where the expertise of someone who is remote can be brought, and now you feel so much more proficient. So here is someone who's not as skilled as perhaps the engineer back is in fact able to do more complex operations than ever before. And the fact that connectivity, the fact that things like image recognition, which is fundamental to how these holograms get superimposed on an analog world, work is in fact giving people more skills and more superpowers. So I think you're right. Teaching people more diverse set of subjects beyond STEM could in fact become more important. Uh, Good for us humanists. Uh, you've said just now about augmenting intelligence rather than just pure artificial intelligence. And you've talked about ways just now that machines can work with people. Do you think that the quest of a company like Microsoft should be creating uh, technology that replaces humans or, play, or creating technology that partners with humans? I for sure am focused on technology that partners with humans. It doesn't mean that some of this technology does not replace some of the human activity that we do today. Uh, that's sort of the, distinguish, uh, the, the, the distinction. But I do want technology that is fundamentally going to bring out the best in us, give us that productivity gain, give us the avenues to be more creative, give us to have the impact that we all seek to have in the world. Uh, that's definitely what I want us. Like, for example, one of the things that uh, we're very enthused about is Cort Cortana, which is something that Yuri talked about, which is agents are definitely like the web. I think it's the third runtime. If you sort of said PC operating system was sort of the beginning of personal computing, then we have the web. What is the new runtime to me is this runtime around agents, personal assistants. And the idea of the personal assistant for me is it's not about replacing my administrative assistant, actually. It is, in fact, giving me my time back where in all this abundance I have of compute power, what I don't have is the attention span, uh, perhaps, to be able to really love, live a full life, to be able to enjoy every moment. But if I could have an assistant that, in fact, knows me, knows my context, knows the world, and can help me, that is helping me. You said a moment ago, though, that you'd be creating technology that replaces some of what humans do, takes over of what some of humans do. The argument that's gone on for 200 years, ever since the Luddites were smashing the looms, is that technology will create fewer jobs. If technology makes us productive, will there be more jobs or fewer jobs in the future? Look, there is no question that with every new technology, there is massive displacement that we have had to deal with. Uh, it is true in the Industrial Revolution. It's going to be true in this dig digital age or AI age. And an argument can be made that in the past, there was enough time for the person being displaced to in fact retire so that their children could get skilled in something else and find a job. Right after all, we've seen some of the biggest uh, displacement or migration from the agrarian economy uh, to the service economy of the modern uh, United States. And that has been a generational shift as opposed to happening within, within a generation. And so therefore, I think we might have to deal with this uh, much more than we have dealt with in the past. So then my answer to that, or at least 
my one solution to that is that means we got we, this entire notion that somehow I'll go to school, I'll get educated in a skill, and I'll get a job, and that's it, and I'll be in that job. I think those days are over. Uh, we will have to deal with as a society, as an economy, reskilling on a constant basis. We see that even in high tech. Uh, when we look at, for example, one of the biggest things that I'm going to probably push is how do I teach software engineers some of these new techniques to be relevant uh, going forward? And what will Microsoft do to help reskill our society? Will you create products and services and LinkedIn, you know, tie that in for that? For sure. That is, in fact, one of the things that I think a lot about. Um, and Yuri touched on this, which I was thinking about, which is we sort of said, there is what, a one trillion dollars of surplus or created every five years now, and the consumer internet has been an amazing thing in the last 10 years. But you look at the productivity stats and the job growth stats, uh, they're pretty stagnant. Um, and so the question I've been asking myself is, you know, whether it's maybe the way we measure productivity or what have you, but nevertheless, how can digital technology in fact, lead to more jobs. The question is, is there going to be a dividend of digital technology that is much more evenly spread uh, between professions, between countries? And in that context, I start, in fact, with how do we enable people to be more creative? What tools can we build uh, to be able to learn, but actually apply that learning to create? Uh, that is at the fundamental pursuit of LinkedIn, because LinkedIn is not just about having your profile and finding a job, but it is about being able to find your economic opportunity uh, and then knowing what skills you need to acquire in order to find that economic opportunity. And that's definitely the pursuit. One of the things we've seen over the past year, culminating with the Brexit vote last Thursday, is a sense of rebellion against you know, trade, immigration, but also technology, and that it's displacing people who used to get up, as you said, get a career, show up at work, and be secure. I heard you talking to Governor Romney earlier today, just in personal conversation, about whether or not this is something that technology is doing or it's something that policy decisions we make can fix. Tell me what you think. Yeah, I mean, here's how I come out at it. Just like the AI topic, where I think it's, there's a responsibility we have as technology companies to have a set of design principles that lead us to create AI that is in help of humanity. I think that we also have to have the responsibility, first, as companies, as businesses, to create economic opportunity. For example, as a multinational company, we have 55% of our revenues are global. I don't think you can just participate as in all of these countries and not create local economic opportunity. In fact, every country I go to, uh, I was very recently in Asia, you know, travel six countries in sort of nine days, and the first thing that I focus on is What's the economic opportunity locally we have created, whether it's the local startups that are getting leverage from our cloud, whether it's the small business that's getting more productive, whether the public sector organization locally is able to do things more efficiently because of what we do. It is so important for us to create that surplus locally uh, in order to have a global business, because I think if you don't, and all you do is rent collection, that's not a stable uh, way to do business globally. Then I believe the same responsibility also lies in our politicians, because I think we as America are better off, and so is every nation, but let's talk about sort of the real beacon of democracy and, um, and progress, that is the United States. We need to be able to make the case for both addressing the inequities of our society and the responsibility we have in a globalized world. We can't pit one versus the other. Because if the political discourse is about one versus the other and choose, in the United States, then 
I think that's just got bad ramifications for the rest of the world. So people like me and my company, we've got to know how to be global citizens and you know, contribute globally. But I also think that the political class in the United States and the political discourse in the United States has to get to a level of sophistication where we are able to deal with both sides of the issues. Because there's no denying that globalization has not led to dividends that have been spread equally. So those are policy choices. They're policy issues. Let's implement those policies better next time. In other words, spread it more equally That's so that correct. there's not a division. You mentioned a moment ago, and this would be a way to help with the economy and empowering people, that you should help create a maker's economy. What do you mean by that, and how is Microsoft doing that? Yeah, this is, you could call it my obsession. Um, I look at it and say, look, you know, I think we are well served today uh, in terms of how to consume digital technology. I mean, there's lots of video to watch. There's a lot of news feeds to sort of flick around. Um, you can even watch others play games. It's fantastic. I mean, I have so much I can do with all my free time. But what about turning it around? What about getting every, you know, one of the things that this summer is going to happen is Minecraft in education. And I look at what kids are creating. Uh, we just recently launched something called Realms, which is a shared space for multiple kids to build their spaces and invite each other. And the creativity of that uh, is just mind-boggling. Because Minecraft even has a physics engine built into it. It's not just about a virtual world. They're able to even build a computer as a virtual computer in Minecraft. And I look at that and say, wow, I think human beings are capable at the very core. And in fact, we want to be at the very core, the right balance between consumption and production. The next wave of innovation, I hope, that half a trillion or one trillion dollars that Yuri is going to make next uh, comes from bets he places on companies that are turning all of us into makers, creators, and expressors. And I, I, I say that with because suppose to somebody who consumes and downloads a video stream, people who create and make products empowered by technology. That's right. And that, I, you know, and I say that because in some level, that's who we are. I mean, I should sort of express that. Because Microsoft, if you look at it, we think the best consumer product we ever created was Excel. Uh, because think about it. People could make sense of numbers before, and now everybody can. I mean, think about a world without Excel. I mean, it's, it's just impossible for me. Uh, but to me, that is, I mean, I love games too, but, you know, it is that sense of ability to express, create, uh, make, build. After all, in fact, Bill dropped out of school to create the first product of our company, which was the basic interpreter. We are a tools company first, before a lot of other things we did. And I think the, and that is what I want the next 10 years of sort of our technology innovation to represent. You know, it was the, uh vision that both Bill Gates and Steve Jobs shared, which is a company that will empower people to make things. And that's what you're now trying to return to with that. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's, in fact, when I joined the company in 92, we used to talk about our mission as uh, PC in every home and every desk. But to me, yeah. that, weirdly enough, you know, we achieved at least that in the most developed world by end of the decade. And the thing that I've been trying to get back to is what is really the, the identity or the ethos behind what got us to build a PC, and that's what about, that's the empowerment, the notion of empowering every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And to me, organizations matter, uh, because I think about institutions that human beings build so that it outlasts them as, in fact, a very important thing in society. And with Microsoft, you, your choice as CEO, to become CEO, they finally took a product person. How, being a product person, did that change you versus being like Steve Ballmer, who was a marketing person? Or well, we go through many companies that have chosen finance, marketing, whatever. It would turn to the roots to have a product person leading the company. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That is definitely how I think. Um, 
the thing that I would say, Walter, is the way, you know, as you described it, I'm a consummate insider. I mean, I've grown up at Microsoft. That's pretty much all my professional experience. And the thing that I've tried to do as objectively as one can do being a consummate insider is to try and look at it with a fresh set of eyes. And to be able to understand or rekindle what is it that drove success, what is it that drives our passion, and be able to bring that back in what is a very changed technology landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, about, in, the way I in fact think about it is like mission and sense of purpose is constant and culture needs to be renewed, but technologies are always And the biggest changing. change in the technology landscape is what? The cloud, For big sure. data? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the way I you know, even described it in the first piece of email uh, I wrote was, it's, we live in a world where computing is everywhere, it's ubiquitous, and uh, intelligence is going to be ambient. Um, and I sort of later on sort of made it simple for, you know, for consumption, called it mobile first, cloud first. And what I mean by that is, it's the mobility of the human experience, because you want to be able to go from place to place and be able to have your applications, your data, your uh, experience move with you versus being bound to any one computing device. In fact, I say the mistake we made was perhaps to think of PC as the hub for all things for all time to come. Right. And n n I don't think that'll ever be the case. There'll be a period of time when one device is a high volume device, but computing itself is going to become more and more ubiquitous. And the cloud is the control plane. What enables that mobility is the cloud. And even cloud, people sometimes think about it too narrowly. It's not a destination. It's a new form of computing, uh, which is going to be truly distributed. And it will help sort of create the artificial intelligence in some ways that you've talked about. You said you wanted to have rules of the road, almost moral rules of the road. You mentioned Asimov. His first rule, if I remember correctly, you probably remember it, was that a computer can never do something to harm a human. A human yeah. Is That's that right. true? Have we, That's right. I think have that, we violated that already? With I don't, I, I mean, that is the choice we get to make. I don't believe so. I mean, in fact, one of the fundamental uh, examples I used in my piece, for example, was we have a deep learning uh, network around computer vision that's being used by this one gentleman, in fact, who built it, uh, who's visually impaired to be able to see the world. In other words, he's interpreting. So this piece of equipment he wears on his eyes interprets the world because it sees the world and translates it into him, for him. Do you think a device like that could ever be programmed, I guess is the word, to have empathy? Here's what I believe. I believe that we as programmers ultimately need to take accountability for even the automated judgments of machines. So if that makes any sense, because after all, we are designing them. We are designing them in ways that they are going to learn themselves, right? Because one of the fundamental things about artificial intelligence is you're not programming them, you're creating these learning systems. And these learning systems learn from data. But yet, I think one of the fundamental challenges we have in front of us is how can you have accountability? One of Asimov's rules was that humans could always take back the power that from the correct. machines, That's which correct. you've just described might violate that rule if they can learn and start doing things on their own. But you should be able to. In fact, one of the things I wrote as one of the, the new rules that we need to have is humans should be able to address any unintended consequence of uh, a, you know, an autonomous decision. Do you think that computers that learn that way may also pick up bias? And how do we stop that, if so? And that, that is correct. And so therefore, one of the things that we ourselves have learned uh, with our experiment with Tay was it learns. It learns from, in fact, human discourse. Um, and if the human discourse has bias, you could, in fact, pick up those as signal. So that means we have to have the responsibility and accountability to design into the system how not to be able to fall into that trap of bias. Give me an example. Which is just like how we teach children. Uh, when somebody, you pick up a bad language uh, at school, we come back, we teach them that, look, this is not the way to be participate in society. If you create, as you said, you have 
uh, facial recognition. Will it know race and will it make judgments based on race? In fact, I would say it should not make judgments based on race. It should, in fact, be able to recognize race, uh, but it's not about passing judgment on race. So that's where I think even the diversity of the team designing uh, the artificial intelligence that is passing that judgment needs to be you know, in place. It's possible that uh, this type of robotics and technology will either increase or decrease inequality in society. Do you think it's the job of people like yourself creating this technology to push the, towards the side of making it more equitable and promoting equality? I think we don't have a long-term business if we do not address the inequities. That's why I go back to what I said, which is, Let's say, you know, I was in um, Egypt uh, at the very beginning of the year. Uh, we talk about our, you know, uh, immigration issues and what are we doing in the refugee camps and what have you. But the real challenge uh, of immigration is right in the Arab world. And be able to contribute to that challenge by saying, okay, what is the level of education being afforded to students in refugee camps in Egypt. What could we help and do is a super important thing for us because if we as a company do not take that extra step going beyond our immediate term revenues, long term we're not going to have a business uh, in Egypt or let alone any other country. So I think that that's one of the multi-constituent things, quite frankly, I've come to realize as a CEO you know, a lot more uh, then even one step removed. Uh, but just saying being you know, victims of just short-term capitalism is just not going to be a way to, in fact, build a long-term business. Uh, I think we can announce something today, which is you finally have gotten a book deal. <laughs> Those of us who write books think that's a big deal. And I think today you're going to announce that you, I think Harper Collins is doing a book. And it's called Hit Reset. Tell me, it's partly about yourself, but it's partly about how all of us have to hit reset, right? I think it's, it's hit refresh. Hit refresh, right. <laughs> I need to reset, you need to refresh. Yeah, hit refresh. Yeah, I mean, um, in, in all honesty, I've not written it. It's just the book deal. I'm told you do the deal first and then you start writing. I hope yeah, that's you the way it me. works. <laughs> um, it's, it, it, it's really more of a book uh, that I hope to write, which is meditations of somebody who's a sitting CEO of a company going through a pretty cathartic transformation. Um, it's a moment in time where there is a lot of change, change with us, there is change in the industry, there is change in the society, uh, and navigating it. Because I felt like one of the things that I think a lot about it all the time, um, and I felt I want to write about it as I'm going through it. It's not a memoir, it's definitely not about something that's a finished project, it's very much uh, the, the, the trials and tribulations of a person going through transformation, which is the hardest thing. Well, let me end with this, which is more personal, because in some ways, going through the transformation you've done. In many ways, you've led an incredibly typical American life. You were born in Hyderabad, India, you went to Mangalore, then I think you got your electrical engineering um, master's degree, University of Wisconsin, you come here. Tell us what your own personal journey as an immigrant, but also somebody who became a great engineer in America, spent 24 years at Microsoft, how that ties in to refreshing Microsoft and even refreshing us as an American society. You know, it's, 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 it's fascinating. Um, I remember the first computer I got uh, was a Spectrum Z80 um, when I was probably in uh, ninth grade, 10th grade. That was the first time uh, I got a computer to play with and it had a basic interpreter. And, and I think about, I wouldn't be in Microsoft, I wouldn't be in the United States but for Microsoft. And it's pretty ironic in that way, in the sense that 
it's the American ingenuity innovation that in fact reached uh, and touched me in growing up in India. Uh, and then the immigration policy of this country that let me come here and then live my life here. Uh, and so I, I feel very blessed on both fronts. That's why I think that this is an amazing country. I'm always optimistic and bullish about what the United States and what the United States is capable of doing and what the United States means to the world. But the thing that perhaps that most strikes me having grown up in, in India is even the brands that I grew up with, many of them multinational, I always could make the difference between companies that were there contributing to the country, to the people of that country, and companies that were just collecting. And I hope that that sensibility is something that I have now being a CEO of a multinational company in a country like the United States, which I think has to be uh, not only innovating, but creating economic opportunity everywhere. Sachin Nadella, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, one quick stretch, and it's going to be my pleasure to introduce you to John Dickerson of Face the Nation and Governor Mitt Romney. Thank you. Mumble, mumble. <laughs> All right, Governor, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, John. Now, let's see. Four years ago, what would you have been doing on a day like today? Uh, let's see. It was probably uh, uh, three or four or five speeches, a couple of rallies, and fundraisers. You know, a huge part of political campaigns these days. Uh, is raising money. I'll bet in my political experience about 60 or 70 percent of your time is spent fundraising and uh, and the other portion is is actually out meeting voters and talking to activists and so forth but that's a uh, that's a typical day and of course then there was a chance to meet with the adoring press. Yes. Which was more enjoyable the fundraising or the press? <laughs> actually before I would do a rally uh, we had a practice of getting three or four couples to sit down with me and spend an hour talking about their lives where I'd get the chance to actually listen. And that was the best part of the day. I, people assumed that all they did was go to rallies and give speeches, but the fun part uh, and actually the most um, optimistic part of the day was hearing how people who don't make the news are actually living their lives. And you come away, by the way, more optimistic and positive in thinking about the country as you do that. You were known as a pretty good fundraiser. Um, did you, though, enjoy it? Would, is it something that if you could fix the system, you would say, you know, we could really do without that? Because that's 70% of the time. Boy, I could be spending it meeting with those people or talking about policy. Look, it's, it's fun to be with fundraisers because the, the, the people are gracious. They're supporting you. They're writing checks to you. And, and it's, a, it's a, a, a wonderful thing. But it's a bad part of politics. And, and I'd far rather, as a person running for office, I'd far rather be out with voters and, and, uh, and trying to convince people why they should vote for me. Uh, we've got a real mess. I mean, I, I hope you realize it, but the combination of, of, of what the Constitution demands uh, and also what, what Congress put in place with, uh, with campaign finance reform is that campaigns are less and less responsible for the message uh, of the candidate and these super PACs which are not run by the campaign or by the candidate are taking a larger and larger role and so there's really no limit on campaign uh, investing if you will contributions there's no limit basically at all anymore 
But the, the change is that instead of the money going to the candidate, who's then responsible for what's said and done with the money, it goes to outside groups. And so in some respects, and I think in a lot of respects, it's worse than if there were no campaign finance limits at all and all the money went to candidates. But right now, we, we've got a very uh, unfortunate uh, finance setting in, in campaigns. And I, I don't want to be too partisan. I'll, I kind of am partisan, obviously. But we, we didn't have as much of a problem when the, the people running for office were, were following the federal guidelines, taking federal money, and that limited what they could do. But when President Obama ran the first time, he's the first post-Nixon uh, uh, presidential candidate to say, I'm not going to abide by federal limits. And John McCain didn't agree to the same thing and therefore got blown away. And, and now I think it's changed forever. And with the current system, we've, we've got a real mess and it's got to change. When you were running, there were a lot of Super PAC ads run against you. How far did the distance get between what you know, knew of as Mitt Romney and the Mitt Romney you heard about in ads, in press coverage? Did you ultimately have to just say, there is this character named Mitt Romney, and he gets the Dickens beaten out of him, and then there's me? I mean, how hard was it to figure out who you exactly were as a candidate when you're getting pounded minute by minute? Uh, you know, I got some advice from a, a political consultant when I first ran for office, or actually when I was running for governor of Massachusetts. He said, look, I'm going to help you on your campaign, but I have a, a couple of rules. Number one is, you can't read the newspaper. And I laughed and I said, no, no, you can, you can read about what's going on in the world, but you can't read about yourself. Because if you do, every time you get up and give a speech, you're going to be thinking about what some 25-year-old wrote about you, and you're going to resp be responding to him or her instead of staying on message. So you can't read that stuff. And so I didn't see the ads uh, that came out against me. I didn't read the articles that defined me. I've gone back and been told a few things and said, gosh, I wish I could have ch created a very different impression. I, you know, obviously, the reason I ran for office was that I fundamentally believe that the principles that I espoused and the principles of conservatism are the most able to help middle-class families get higher wages and more prosperity and help people come out of poverty. But you, you can't, but I can assure you that is not what was presented in the media <laughs> and, and, and by my opponents, obviously, in their ads, and that's the nature of politics. I understand that. I don't, uh, I don't cry about that. But, but what you are and how you're represented by the opposition are very different things, obviously. What did you learn through that process that you would fix if you had to do it over again? Um, well, I think one of the challenges that, that we Republicans have is that through the primary process, and I'm sure it's true for Democrats too, but through the primary process, I'm speaking to people who are activists, who are very, very close to Republican politics and to policy. And so I'll be talking about GDP growth, and I'll be talking about business formation, and how we need to get small businesses thriving. I'll talk about why we have to make America the most attractive place for entrepreneurs and business. And by the way, when you come to the general election, there are a lot of people that are, let's say, working on, on repainting cars or, or, or painting homes, and they're saying, what in the world is he talking about? GDP growth? What the heck is GDP growth got to do with my life? And, and all he's talking about is business. And, and how is that going to improve my life? And I think what I needed to do a lot better, and Republicans generally need to do a lot better, is to say, number one, what we're for, which is we want to make middle-income Americans more prosperous. And we want to help people get out of poverty. And if they ask us, well, how are you going to do that? Then we start talking about business formation and small business because the only way you can get real wages to go up in a country like ours is if you have more enterprises starting and growing and therefore hiring more people and competing to hire more people. And as they compete to hire more people, they have to get their wages up to hire the more people. That's the only way you get real wages up. But I was talking about policy when I think what would have been far more effective uh, is to talk about why the policy. And why the policy is to get wages up, to get earnings up for middle-income families. And, and of course, our Democrat friends, they wisely point out, he's talking about business all the time. He only cares about business people. Heck no, business people do fine under Democrats and Republicans. It's the middle class and the poor that need conservative principles to see rising real wages. 
So you would have given, if you were running again, you'd give a series of speeches on that topic. What other two big tentpole speeches would Romney have given if he were running again? Well, well, again, I mean, the issue that conservatives and Republicans face is that we're not appealing to the growing population of America, the growing demographic populations like we have to. Millennials, minorities, uh, these are two huge groups. Women, uh, women as a percentage of the population obviously aren't growing, but, but we, have, we have succeeded electorally in some parts because the fastest part of the demographic growth profile today is people 65 years of age and older. And we can do pretty well with them, but they're not gonna be around forever. And, and where we're not doing so well is with millennials, young people, and with the, the large and growing minority populations. And until we can connect with those populations, we're gonna have some difficulty electorally. And, and part of my problem was uh, to win the nomination, which is a year long process or longer, you speak to people who vote in Republican primaries. And they tend not to be the millennials or college students, they tend not to be the minorities. So I'm speaking to largely white audiences, day in and day out. My Democratic friends, however, are speaking on college campuses and speaking to minority groups. So when I win the nomination and show up at a black church, they say, where have you been, Mr. Romney? Your opponents have been here for months. And I think someone who wants to win as a Republican, barring an unusual setting like we have now, perhaps, but someone who wants to win as a Republican has to start, has to start competing early on in minority settings and in college campuses and with millennials and, and connecting with women on issues that women care about. If you were to plot the distance between the campaign you've just described in our first 10 minutes and the campaign as it's being run by the Republican nominee now, how far away from you would you put the end point of where that campaign is? Is there any distance there? I, I, uh, no, I, I, you know, um, you've heard what I've said about-, about Would it be uh, in the same state? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've expressed my views about, about Mr. Trump, and, and, and I'm not going to elaborate on that, but, but I can, I, can uh, I, think, I, I think it's unfortunate that, that both on the left and the right, um, with Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders uh, has run a campaign that said, look, all your problems, middle class Americans, are because of those big banks in Wall Street. And, and I've heard him say, we've bailed them out, it's time for them to bail us out. And so we're looking for, for someone to blame. And, and on the right, uh, our nominee is saying, hey look, it's, it's these people here, it's these Mexicans coming across the border. By the way, more Mexicans have gone home in the last five years, according to the Census Bureau, than have come in to the country. And, and, but it's them and it's Muslims and and um, I mean, unfortunately, I'm, I'm afraid that the things that Mr. Trump has said have been um, uh, unfortunately branding of our party in a very negative way, and one which is consistent with the image many people have of my party. And so, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's taken us in a direction which will be uh, very unfortunate long term. I mean, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, said today that, that Donald Trump is not a credible candidate. And he said, but he said there's a, there's a chance for him to become so, and, and this is a quote from him. He said, now that you are in the general, people are looking for a level of seriousness that is typically conveyed by having a prepared text and teleprompter and staying on message. If Donald Trump used a teleprompter and stayed on message, would that answer the questions Republican lawmakers have about him? No. <laughs> I mean, I, it might. It might help electorally. Uh, it may get more people to, to say I'm going to sign on or to, to, to contribute or to vote for, uh, for Mr. Trump. Uh, I think Mr. Trump has demonstrated who he is by virtue of what he said in the process to this, this point. And what he says from this point forward may paper over that. But I think, I mean, my own view is that, that in thinking about who you want to lead the greatest nation in the history of the earth, the most important single characteristic is their character and what kind of person they are in their heart. And, and that's, something which, that's something which people on the right and the left uh, express through their campaigns and through their lifetime, and you make your assessment. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not gonna 
add any fuel to whatever fire you might have burning on that regard yourself. But I, I, I just think that, uh, uh, that at this stage to say, okay, now we're going to try and create different images for either candidate would, uh, would be something that the most American people are going to ignore. Let me do a little history with you for a moment. Given what you've just said and what you have been saying about the Republican nominee, in 1964, your father was at the Cleveland Sheraton uh, with another group of governors, and they all met to begin what was, this, or essentially begin what was the Stop Goldwater movement. Nixon came and tried to convince your father to run. Did he ever talk to you about that movement and about that process? Uh, I was pretty young at that point. And, uh, and, and had the occasion to talk to my dad at some length about what he was going through and what he was thinking about. His um, objection to Barry Goldwater was not his fundamental conservative views, but, but, but two things. One, his um, coddling uh, of groups like the John Birch Society. And number two was, was a, an image that he portrayed that, uh, that he was a resistant to civil rights. And, and the promotion of civil rights was at the heart of the reason my dad ran for office. And, and so the idea that he would get behind Barry Goldwater was something he, he simply could not, could not accept. And, uh, and there was a great effort to try and keep Barry Goldwater from becoming the nominee of the party, not so much because they thought that Barry Goldwater couldn't win, but because they felt that, that he was not the right person to be president and that, that it was important that, that our party be a party of inclusiveness uh, not one of exclusiveness. In your thinking about when you spoke out, was your father's memory, because when you ran, a lot of people, when they talked about your father, they would mention this, the stand he took. When you've thought about the original speech you gave about Mr. Trump, some of the things you said subsequently, do you hear echoes of your father in that? Do you think about that? Do you see those parallels at all? You know, I, I think... I think people who live their whole life in politics um, may, and I, it's hard for me to generalize because I'm not one of them, but, but those that have, have done so measure almost everything they do or say by what its impact will be on their, their power, their political fortune, their party's fortune. And I understand that and I respect that. They wouldn't be in office, if, they wouldn't be running for office if they didn't think they could do a better job than someone else. I spent my life in the private sector. That's where my career was. I was a venture capitalist and private equity guy. You know that. And a consultant for many years. And, and I grew up in a home with a dad who followed the same path. Uh, my dad spent his life in, the, in a car company. He ran a car company that made Jeeps and Ramblers and got involved in politics very late in life. And so the things that, that I watched my dad do were without political calculation for him or for his party. He basically did what he felt was right and let the chips fall where they may. And by the way, the chips did not fall favorably for him. I mean, he came back from Vietnam, for instance, you weren't all around by then, and said, look, I just got a great brainwashing in Vietnam by the American generals. They're lying to the American people. And that killed his presidential prospects. But it was true. And, and Robert McNamara admitted it 20 years later. Yeah, we were lying to the American people. And my dad was absolutely right. But, but he, he never looked back. He never said, oh, I can't believe that these people didn't follow me. No, he just said what he believed. And, and so, you know, I have the luxury of having lived a life with children and grandchildren and, and entrepreneurship, which I find entirely fulfilling and which gives me a self of self-worth. And whether people love me or do not is not how I define myself. So when it comes to saying things like I've said, yeah, I'm channeling my dad in the sense that I don't know how, he, well, I do know how he'd react to the current uh, nominee, but I... I and, and how would that be? Uh, but, I, but I can tell you this, that... Let's that, note the governor that, ducked that, the question. That, that, that exactly, that uh, I don't want to get my dad in the same trouble I'm in. Uh, <laughs> But, but, uh, but my dad would speak out forcefully on what he believed, regardless of the consequence and regardless of the hate mail and the threats that come as part of it. And, uh, and he'd do it because, well, frankly, I mean, th this, this nation, I mean, I remember I was with, with Lech Walesa. One of the great privileges of running for office is you meet really extraordinary people, heroes in all walks of life. And I got to go to Poland, I meet Lech, Lech Walesa, I, I came in, he said, Mr. Romney, you must be tired, you've flown overnight, time zone change, 
He said, you sit down, I'll talk, you listen. <laughs> and, and so I took, him, uh, I took his advice and sat down and, and he said, uh, Mr. Romney, where is American leadership? Look what's happening in Afghanistan. Where's American leadership? Look what's happening in Pakistan. Look what's happening in the Middle East. Let's look, and he went around the world, region by region, and described in some detail what was happening there and said, where is American leadership? We need American leadership. And, and I, I sat there nodding. After the meeting was over, he came out and endorsed me for president. This was, <laughs> I said, boy, the, the less I talk, the better I do. And, <laughs> but this, this nation's leadership is essential to freedom here and around the world. The world depends on America. I mean, look what's happened in Syria. And the absence of American leadership has led to hundreds of thousands being killed, millions being displaced. It is in part responsible for even the, the Brexit vote with, with millions of people moving into Europe. I mean, a absence of American leadership has enormous consequence. And, and, and that just, it just breaks my heart to, to see us talking about, with candidates that are talking about withdrawing from leadership. I'm not talking about military action. I'm talking about soft power and using our influence. And, uh, and this, is a, uh, this is a challenging time for the world and one where we need leaders that will, that will stand up and, and lead. So if you, would, if you were still in business and somebody came to you and said, American leadership is that threatened, the conservative views that you hold dear and, and think are important to a major party in America, is that threatened? Would you in business have said, well, we hope it turns out okay. What would your action plan be? Well, I'm not suggesting that everybody runs for office, uh, uh, but, I, but I do suggest that people who care about the direction of the country be involved very aggressively, uh, financially, if you if you got a lot of money, time-wise, if you got a lot of time, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, you're talking. It's in your nature, though. Yes, it is. Yes, and my genes. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but uh, you're talking in sort of apocalyptic terms when you say it breaks your heart. You know, when you talk about people should run for office and give money, but I'm talking about today. There are efforts afoot to try to find an independent candidate. You said you would support an independent candidate. So make the pitch for why an independent candidate who believes as you do in American leadership, who believes as you do in the tenets of conservatism, why they should run. Well, I think um, it's very high, highly probable that either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump is the next president. And, and so uh, an independent candidate, I would, I'd love to see someone run who I can vote for and feel good about. Uh, I have to be honest, uh, Hillary Clinton, in my view, is not an ideal person to be president. Uh, I disagree with her policies on a whole host of, uh, uh, of areas. Although as P.J. O'Rourke, did you read what he said? He said, you know, Hillary Clinton is wrong on every issue, but she's wrong within the normal parameters. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, so he's a, he's a funny fellow, but I, but I disagree with her on so many things I can't possibly vote for. Her. And at the same time, uh, as I've expressed about Mr. Trump, I, uh, I believe on the basis of temperament uh, and, uh, uh, and, and character that those are areas where, where I feel I simply can't vote for him. And so on that basis, I'm going to be, I'm going to be voting, I'll either write in my wife's name, who'd be an ideal president, or... Uh, <laughs> Uh, or I'll write in the name of a, of a third-party uh, third candidate. And, but most people will choose between those two. And, and by the way, I understand both arguments. For, for people who are conservatives and have always voted Republican and want to vote Republican again and say, there's just no way I can vote for Hillary Clinton, I, I understand that there are some who, who say, like me, I just can't vote for Mr. Trump for the reasons I've outlined. But, there, but they say, uh, on the other hand, they say, if we elect Hillary Clinton, we're going to have a court which will take us in a direction I don't like, and therefore I'm gonna vote for Mr. Trump and support him because it's, it comes down to the Supreme Court. Both arguments I understand. I'm not gonna argue with people as they choose uh, which path to, uh, to take, um, but, but for me, it's a matter of personal conscience and I can't vote for either one of those two people. For a lot of, for a lot of people who share your view, it's unsatisfying and scary that, as you've said, potentially Donald Trump could be president even if they don't like Hillary Clinton. They also see other reasons that it's worth running. One, it, one is you've got down-ballot candidates in the Republican Party. If Republican voters stay home, those candidates in competitive states, 
Ohio, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Florida, New Hampshire, those candidates all go down, you suddenly have a Democratic Senate. And also that the conservative viewpoint that you believe in, you've articulated here and you've articulated in your campaigns, that if no one stands up and makes the case for that in the face of the campaign that's about to be run, that those ideas take real harm, take generational harm, and that it's worth running even if maybe you don't have the clear shot to victory, but that those two things are worth an independent candidate running for because those ideals are worth fighting for. Look, I'm not going to argue uh, against having a third-party candidate run. I'd, I'd love to see uh, someone run on the libertarian uh, ticket, for instance. I wish Bill Weld were at the top uh, because I knew Bill Weld as the governor of my state of Massachusetts, and he was a terrific governor. I, I think he'd be a great, uh, great president. I don't know Gary Johnson as well, and I'm, I'm not endorsing the libertarians at this point. But I'd like to see someone run who, who uh, I mean, it's very possible both nominees implode in one way or another, and uh, and, and and someone would emerge. But I still think. It's is by far the most likely outcome that either, either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump are the nominee. And I'm going to spend my time, therefore, campaigning for people who present a view of conservatism, which I think is consistent with the values and the, and the uh, aspirations that I've described. So I'm going to be working for something called Save Our Senate, SOS, and I'll be out campaigning for Republican uh, candidates for Senate. And I'm also working with Team Ryan which is Paul Ryan's effort to raise money to elect Republican congressmen and congresswomen. Uh, and, and so I think you're going to find that there will be some uh, Republicans who will get behind the presidential nominee and work with him. There'll be others who want to distance themselves from, from that uh, nominee. And, and I'll be working with them, trying to promote their message and hopefully distinguish. I th By the way, I, th I think it's very possible. I'm not a political scientist, and so I can't tell you what the long-term impact will be of the uh, Trump uh, nomination on the Republican Party. But I do think most people recognize that Donald Trump is a departure from traditional Republican uh, uh, philosophies and, and nominees. And as a result, if he's highly successful and becomes president, uh, he may define our party. But if he's not successful, why I think, I, I don't think the whole party is forever changed by virtue of his nomination. I don't think it would have helped by any means for him to have been the nominee if he's unsuccessful. But, uh, but I think the party goes on and I think other voices that have stood up, whether it's Ben Sass or Tom Cotton or, or Rob Portman and, and, or Kelly Ayotte, I mean, and by the way, some of these have endorsed Donald Trump. I think those voices will, will prevail in the, uh, in the decades that follow. Some people think that he's defining a better Republican Party. They feel that their leaders have been uh, not listening to them. They've been betrayed repeatedly by their leaders in Washington. And that Donald Trump is ushering in uh, a better Republican Party. Oh, I, look, I understand that the, the great appeal of Donald Trump and, by the way, of Bernie Sanders, all right, which is a lot of people are angry. And a lot of people have been promised that certain policies coming from Washington would make their lives better. And their lives aren't better. And in many cases, they're worse. And, and so they're looking for people who, one, acknowledge that they haven't been delivered what was promised and that America hasn't, hasn't offered them the opportunity and prosperity and safety they expected. And, and so they look for people who at least acknowledge that and both Bernie Sanders and, and Donald Trump certainly recognize that and appeal to that recognition. Um, but then the question is, well, are the things they sang, are those things actually going to help those people or not? And I think both in the case of Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, the policies they promoted uh, and the rhetoric they've, they promoted has not been conducive to actually improving the lives that have been so seriously uh, hurt and left behind. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I, you know I, I don't know what we're going to do over the next four years or eight years, but, but you certainly have to give both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump credit for having identified a, an anger, an understandable anger on the part of the American people and having tapped into it at the same time. I, you know, I, I wish that instead of promoting that anger, that we had promoted an inclusiveness that would actually provide a brighter future for all Americans and recognize that this is a nation, a highly diverse and inclusive nation, which, which has benefited and will continue to benefit by the, the, the many cultures of people that exist in this great land. Did the Republican... 
when you say we, wish we had promoted inclusiveness, are, who's the we there? The Republican Party? The well, you don't. A, par a party doesn't. You might think that a party has this, like a corporation, a board of directors and senior people that get to decide what it stands for. But that's not how it works. At the center of the Republican Party and the center of the Democratic Party, at the top of it are these, these uh, national committees, which are really, uh, I mean, they're very toothless. They're, they're, they're not very powerful. They don't get to set policies and so forth. Oh, sometimes they're involved in writing a platform, but who the heck knows what the Democrat or Republican platform might be? The, the, the people who set the tone of the party and the policies of the party are the voters who get to choose among, in our case, 15 people who put out different visions. They choose one. It's the voters. And, and so the Republican primary voters decided that Donald Trump represented what they thought our party should stand for in this election. I happen to think that that selection will be harmful to us in appealing to millennials, women, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans. I think it's a very unfortunate choice, but it's not something which the Republican National Committee or the elected officials chose. Should they change that system, the Republican Party? You know, um, I don't know how you do that. I mean, normally we look to the people to make the, the, the best choices. Um, you know, we are a republic, and, we, uh, and the founders were, were very nervous of sort of pure democracy. I mean, John Adams, uh, you know, wrote famously that every democracy commits suicide. Every democracy kills itself. There never was a democracy yet, he says, where the, the people don't uh, vote themselves into oblivion. And, uh, and so we, we have this idea that the, the people at large choose people of character and integrity and vision and experience to lead and then trust them to study issues in such depth that they can make the right decisions. Sometimes we, we might disagree with the decisions they make, but with time, hopefully, they, they bear fruit. Um, in, in the selection of our nominees, uh, we're, we're struggling with how to, how to choose people who, who, where, where character and integrity and experience is foremost, as opposed to the ability to, to debate on the stage or to, uh, to entertain. Uh, and and uh, that's, a, that's a challenge for us. Did Trump surprise you, or did you say, well, based on the way I ran, I can see how this... Total, complete surprise. I, I didn't think he'd run in the first place because I assumed that he'd never put out his tax returns. I got half that right. All right, all right. Uh, so I never thought he'd run. And, uh, and, and I thought if he did run, why, he would just be swept aside easily. But a lot of things, one, he was far more effective uh, as, a, as a politician than I had expected. And two, the circumstances worked to his favor. I think having 14 or 15 opponents uh, that were dividing other part of the electorate was, was working to his advantage. Um, I think one of the great mistakes the other campaigns made was, uh, was to focus on one another. I think the other campaigns assumed he would disappear and they just had to knock down the others of the 15, so they attacked one another. And, uh, and, and as a result, uh, they, they got swept aside and he was left standing. And I think he also played a brilliant role with the media. I mean, the guy got on TV every day, every single day. He got more media coverage than all the other candidates combined uh, in, in my party. So, you know, you put all that together, it was a, a very successful nomination process and one I would not like to see repeated. Before we, uh, before we do a couple issues before we head out, I just want to button up a couple of things. How actively are people still asking you to run? Because I talked to some of them, so I know they are. Uh, there are, there are some, some very generous people who, who uh, asked me to run again, and I say, aren't you kind? Uh, and the reality, the, the reality is uh, that, that I, you know, I, I, of course, you think about things like that from time to time. I don't think an independent candidate can win. All right, that's that's a challenge, and but the aren't idea. There are other bigger things at, at and, issue, and 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 the idea of, of running and 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 asking people to come around me, with the sole purpose of being a spoiler, is not something I could go out in good faith to, to donors and to, and to workers and voters and say, hey, come come help me stop this candidate or that candidate.
your kids took a vote when you ran last time. They take another one this time? Yeah, my, uh, uh, my wife and kids wanted me to run again this time, uh, interestingly enough. And, uh, uh, and they, you know, I've got some kids, I got an email from one of my sons yesterday saying, you got to get in, Dad, you got to get in. Uh, and, uh, uh, which is very, kind of a strange thing to me, uh, that, that, because running for president is a great and thrilling experience if you do it yourself. Uh, because you get to see amazing people, you make friends that you would have never imagined you'd get to make and that, that change your life. I happen to think, by the way, the real currency in life, I mean, I know some people think the currency in life is your balance sheet. In my view, your currency in life is the people you love and that love you, your friends, friendships. That is the currency of life. And running for president has increased my net worth massively in the currency that counts. But it's hard on family. It's hard on your spouse sitting there in debates, uh, just agonizing over what you're going to say next, or, or what your kids have to go through, or your grandkids go through. And so for my wife and kids to say, um, you know, do it again, uh, and I'm talking about late in the process here, they were, they were concerned about the direction of the nominating process well, in our party. And, but I, I looked at it and I said, you know, I, I, I just don't think in good conscience that I'm the right person uh, to run as long as there was a better alternative who had a better chance of winning, uh, rather. And, and once the nomination was locked up, I didn't see a, a, a chance of winning that was realistic. But wait, why is that weird? You saw your dad get beat up and still have all kinds of strong feelings about him. Why aren't they doing just the identical thing? Well, they are, and I, and I appreciate the fact that they're doing that. But my dad didn't run when there was no chance of winning. As a matter of fact, he, when he, he ran for president in 1968, and he met, it's a strange, I don't understand why this isn't happening. He met with other people who were thinking of running for president. Nelson Rockefeller, Bill Scranton, uh, 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 Percy, Chuck Percy of, of Illinois, um, uh, the governor of, uh, uh, of Rhode Island. Um, his son is uh, the governor. Chafee? John Chafee was his name. John Chafee. So he got together with these guys. And they all said, which of us stands the best chance of beating Richard Nixon in the primary process? And they concluded it was my dad. So they all decided they would not run and he would run. And he ran and he said this, he says, look, if I get to a position where it looks like I'm not the best guy to carry the water here, I'll drop out and let one of you take over. And after his comments about Vietnam, that he'd been brainwashed there and that we were being lied to by our generals, he dropped out and Nelson Rockefeller took over. And, and I, you know, that's not happening today. I don't know why that doesn't happen. But, uh, but when, he, when he ran for office, he ran because he believed he could win. And when he felt he could no longer win, then he stepped out of the way. So someone who had a better chance, who believed the things he did, could actually run. So the door totally closed. Yeah, the door, the door is closed unless both candidates come to me and ask me to please save them. I think that's <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> so, I, can't, I can't imagine the circumstances that would lead me to be in the race. You talked a little bit about Brexit, but um, give us your sense of the fallout, what it means for the United States, what it means uh, for... Well, on, on substance, um, in terms of what's really happened here, I, I don't think it's seismic. Uh, but, but politically and psychologically, it could have enormous impact. And uh, why do I say that? Great Britain isn't going to go away. They're not going to stop buying things. They're not going to stop exporting things. Uh, ever since Vasco da Gama, the world has been getting more and more uh, close in terms of trade, and that's going to continue. That's not going to stop. Um, on the other hand, psychologically, uh, our central banks don't have the power they used to have because they've, they've shot their wad. And, and so psychologically, if people get scared, and, and we see a recessionary activity, both from boards as well as from consumers, well, you could throw the, 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 the country or the world into recession, and that has enormous human impact. Politically, you could have other nations decide they're gonna pull out of trade, they're gonna pull out of immigration policies that are uh, uh, conducive to their economic vitality. If those things start to happen, why, the consequence could be pretty significant. But the substance, not seismic, psychologically and, and politically, it could be pretty substantial. 
Donald Trump got into a fight with the Chamber of Commerce today, which he thinks is working to his advantage on the question of the uh, TPP. The consensus for trade has fallen, has gotten taken a real hit in this it, within your party. Who um, who speaks now for the benefits of trade? Who dares speak for the benefits of trade in the Republican Party when you described earlier what happened to you in your campaign? Well, Paul Ryan uh, speaks for trade. I mean, Paul Ryan is an extraordinary leader. I mean, you have to. This is a guy who who took responsibility for a, a Congress that most people thought was incapable of doing anything, where where we had and, and within my party an enormous division. And he's able to get them to come together and, and agree on six major proposals uh, with virtual unanimous support of 247 or so uh, congressmen and congresswomen. And, and Paul Ryan believes, as I do, that properly executed trade agreements and properly enforced trade agreements are good for middle class and, and lower income individuals and that the trade will, will make us more prosperous as a nation and as a world. At the same time, people who are concerned about trade recognize that there have been a lot of abuses in trade agreements and in trade enforcement. And in my view, those, those abuses uh, combined with other currents, namely technology and immigration, have made it such that trade doesn't look like it works very well for the American people. And it hasn't worked very well for a lot of people. And, and that's led to this strong uh, anti-trade sentiment, which, which I think is unfortunate for the long-term uh, economic vitality of the American middle class. He's speaking up for trade, but it, the tension here is that is the nominee of the party is not speaking up for that. There are a lot of people who are his members in the, in the House. So uh, it seems like all the the passion, the push, I mean, sort of Paul Ryan is feeling the crucible of the party. He's, he believes in trade, but he's supporting Donald Trump. That seems to be an insoluble problem. I think it's very difficult for all of us conservatives and Republicans uh, when the nominee of our party has, has said things that, that we disagree with vehemently and also has policies that we disagree with. It's not unheard of, by the way, to, to only agree with the nominee 80%. I think Mr. Trump has extended that percentage pretty substantially for some. And, and so for, for Paul Ryan to be able to accommodate some of the differences, I don't think that is that unusual. But, um, uh, but we obviously we face an electoral challenge this fall. And, and, uh, and Donald Trump uh, is, is a, a pursuing a course on a policy basis and on a rhetoric and attitude basis, which is very different than traditional conservative thought and, and traditional conservative campaigns. But so far, he's been winning. And, um, and so I, I can't predict what the outcome's gonna be. I, I really, I mean, I think there are people who think it's gonna be a landslide one way or the other. I, I, I just don't know what's gonna happen. I think this political season, and the, the resentment some people feel, the, uh, the fact of, of having a, a sense that they've been let down by, by their elected officials, that all these things have combined to make this a very difficult election to predict. Final question, and it's yes or no. You've, you've said that you won't vote for Hillary Clinton, and you have a, a list of things you disagree with her. But if it comes down to Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump, who is the more qualified candidate for the job of the presidency of the United States? Um, you know, I, I, uh, uh, it, it, neither one, in my view, are the, are the ones I'm going to vote for. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about qualifications. I can't say this. Oh, <laughs> you've uh, lost the room. Yeah. No, no, I, I, am not going to, I, am not going to make news. I, I've learned, I, I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to spend my, my summer running around the country campaigning against Donald Trump uh, or campaigning against Hillary Clinton. I'm going to campaign for people I believe in, and there are a lot of them out there. And, uh, and, and so I, 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 this, look, this, uh, this country and what we represent is so critical here, and we're, it's such a, a, a pivotal point. I know it's a one-word answer, but you listened to the people here a little earlier. I, I happen to be very optimistic about the future of the country. And the reason I say that is technology is about to radically transform our economy. And innovation is going to be the watchword over the next couple of decades and longer. 
And America is the innovative center of the planet, without question, for a lot of reasons. It's in our culture, it's in our legal system, it's in our financial system. America can lead the world. And the only way that's not going to happen is if government really messes things up, which it's inclined to do out of Washington. And, and so th this is a, such a critical time for us to have real leadership so that we can make sure that we can transition to continue to lead the world, which depends on us for, for freedom. But number two, so that the people who are displaced by all that's going to be going on find ways to participate in the new economy. And, and I, you know, I just don't see that in either people, either of the people running for president right now. And, and uh, I, you know, I hope we see that in the people that we, that we elect in Congress and in the, in the Senate. But uh, gosh, it matters. Please get involved in, in the campaigns you care about. Uh, America needs you. And uh, boy, what a, what a tough position we're in right now. Look, love you guys. Good to be with you. It's an honor to be here. Thanks so very much. Thanks, John.